Yeah, so now that everybody's been stuck by Cantara, um, we'll, we'll keep moving along. So uh, thanks, folks. I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the ongoing work of the uh, Cantara IRM working group. Um, again, just sort of the timeline. You know, these folks got together, started talking about the fact that <clears throat> as an industry, you know, there was probably a need for uh, some new approaches for some of the challenges that existed. The, Principles came out in 2015. Um, then, then, so then, just take you through where the work, what, what the work, where the working group went, and what we've been doing since then. Um, so great. So we've got this idea of uh, identity relationship management. The next thing we wanted to actually see is you know, so let's do a better job of defining what that is. So we put together a PowerPoint deck around this. All of these things are on the working group wiki. Um, just with some of our own ideas of describing that, and just working it out within the group. Um, and then once we'd figured out what we thought it actually was, we went out and began to see if we could find instances of it out there in the world. Um, and we went through a bunch of use cases, all, all the while doing that, looking at this original set of design principles that we had come up with to see how well they reflected what we actually thought this was and what, what we thought we saw out there yeah, in the wild. Um, and with the idea that as a next step, what we would do is refine those principles. And so this is a report that was just made available over the weekend. I believe there's a press release coming out today from Cantera about it, um, which is the, the, you know, the refining of these design principles. And uh, I mean, and the, and the interesting thing about that is that we sort of narrowed this down, figured out where we want to go next. Um, but one of the things that we figured out where we wanted to go next Sure. Uh, one of the things where we figured out where we wanted to go next was, in fact, engage across Cantara. Um, I mean, and, what, and one of the interesting things for in working inside Cantara is that there happens to be a bunch of related efforts right now that are dealing with some of the the, the issues around what we found inside our working group. Um, he has a long-standing UMA contributor. I'm kind of happy to be in the segue here with he because, again, I think. You know, UMA is, is, in fact, looking at relationship management. Consent is looking at relationship management. Every time we look for a use case around relationship management, we're looking at IOT. IOT. Um, what Otto's doing around federation, it's the same sort of issues. Um, so rather than sort of staying in a little uh, narrow relationship management working group, what we want to try to do is uh, sort of gauge and cross Cantara and see how we might sort of bring the rest of the organization into this. So. Um, so we're going to try to uh, not only continue our work, but rope other people into it as well. Um, so the idea behind why this all came to pass is that you know there's sort of this perfect storm that's out there of IoT, you know, mobile, cloud, and the fact that things have gone from you know sort of this nice manageable thing inside the walls to uh, basically man managing external relationships or as much a, folks, a focus as internal ones. Um, you know, that, that's sort of where, what drives it, you know, the mandatory funny cartoon about the Internet of Things and how it's changing everything. Um, but, you, but, you know, more and more today, uh, you know, the proliferation of these things is, is, is nothing to laugh about. Um, you know, I mean, I get, and when we did the work, you know, it's not like we thought we were reinventing anything. You know, a lot of props were given to Kim and the laws of identity, um, a lot of which still hold, but, you know, in 2005, um, it was postulating about, th I, you know, I reread the work just sort of just recently and, and sort of coming in preparing for the talk. And uh, the idea of things was this nascent idea, right? So, you know, so Kim is talking about the internet and saying someday we're going to start dealing with things too, right? And so, yeah, and sort of 10 years later, we're overrun by things. So, I mean, thing, so, haha, <laughs> things change. Um, um, so the, these are the principles that we've come up with and condensed it to. Um, you know, I'd, I'd say that the, co the core ones is slightly out of order. Uh, the core ones here seem to be sort of provable, um, mutable, and revocable. And the things that are provable, mutable, and revocable allow us to constrain, delegate, and scale. That's kind of a, in a, in a gist where we've gotten to this. Um, I'm actually going to be giving an expanded uh, soundtrack to this at uh, 
5.15 this afternoon, so I've got 45 minutes to go through it. So, not, so people would like to uh, see you know, more of the details around this. Uh, yeah, ha happy, happy to, happy to rejoin that conversation later. These are the changes that we made. So what, what used to be, we had something which is called acknowledgeable. We pulled that in approvable. Um, what was transferable became delegable. Immutable, immutable, it, it, be, it couldn't be one, it needed to be both. And so rather than saying it was immutable, we decided that it would be mutable. And, and the, the set of mutable things includes some things that are immutable at times. Uh, but it certainly wasn't, couldn't be one or, the, or to the exclusion of the other. Um, yeah, you'd be surprised how many times, you know, it's like, let's start the counter now, how many times you're gonna hear context this week, right? Um, you know, that, that, that'll, that'll set some buzzer off. Um, and then actionable is, is in, dissolves in the world of this relationship manager, which is where I'm gonna wrap up this talk this morning, is sort of on where we're going next, is to explore what, what is this relationship manager and what's its role, and, you know, and is this kind of the access control engine and the thing that you design a, an architecture and a system around for doing a, uh, you know, it would affect is distributed authorization and managing of, of personalities in the context that you have in the world today. Um, yeah, and UMA could very well play a strong role in that. And the other thing that we decided is that it was, we probably spent enough time talking about this and writing words down, um, and that we needed to move the, the work of the work group in, into um, it, it, it's probably non-textual areas, so we're going to be looking at relationship notation language, non-textual representation, uh, graphical representation, graph databases, and tr trying to keep things restful or else you'll get howled out of here. Um, as an old PKI guy, I learned that about 10 years ago when I first showed up. Um, and, so, and that's it for this morning. Um, yeah, I just want to thank you. Here's the working group. Look, download the paper. Let us know what you think. Thank you very much for your time. Um, and I'm really happy to uh, segue to Eve, I believe, <coughs> and uh, the user managed access group, which I've been a, uh, a, a very happy participant of for some time and uh, really excited about the work that's going on there. Well, so. sure, Eve. Do, do you want um, you'll need to disconnect. Um, so I'm going to tell a story while I connect this. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I will. Um, so, uh, funny story. Uh, User managed access has been going on for a long time, and um, we've learned a lot of lessons over the way. But one of the original components of UMA was actually called a relationship manager. We actually have some um, artifacts that in, in our uh, in our wiki in the Kantara wiki that show that the the authorization uh, server uh, is called a relationship manager in the original conception of UMA, so, so there you go. So I'm gonna show this report, and we're gonna present, and hopefully that will look nice. Is that the right size? Let's see, it looks all right, I think. That's, that's what it looks like, so we're gonna go with that. Great, um, so I think, I think UMA and IRM have been in sync all along, sisters under the skin. So, um, so I'm going to give a, a status report on a lot of things because I have, I guess I have my fingers in a lot of pies at Kantara. So UMA and a subgroup of UMA and also the blockchain and smart contracts work group. And um, actually, I think probably some people here know that I invented a drinking game. I know it's 9.40 in the morning, but the drinking game is when you hear the word blockchain, you drink. <laughs> so woohoo, CIS everybody. Um, but first up is actually user managed access. Um, and I've made these tiny URLs so that you can always go easily to um, find the UMA homepage, uh, wiki homepage. And also UMA has uh, a Twitter handle if you want to follow along on the latest news and sometimes interact with us, UMAWG. So please follow that handle. We'd love to have you there. Um, a must see presentation. Uh, I say that because I'll be presenting with Justin Richer, and if you've ever seen a presentation by Justin, it's a special event. Uh, we'll be presenting on introducing UMA 2.0, uh, just down the hall, I guess, from here. Thursday, 2.15, don't miss it. Uh, that's all about the latest news. Oh, right there, there you go. Um, so that'll be a, a deep dive on the latest news about UMA 2.0, but I'll be sharing with you just a little bit of a, a, little bit of a status here quickly. So who here, 
doesn't know anything at all about user managed access. Okay, we got, got some people who are new to it. So I prepared for this. Um, it is based on OAuth. And I'm gonna guess you're familiar with OAuth somewhat. Anybody here not familiar at all with OAuth? As I suspected. So I'm gonna show, show you here some, some language just slightly paraphrased from the newest version of, of UMA. Oh, this is kind of fuzzy, but I, I'll do the dramatic reading. This is intended to um, explain, in a nutshell, benefits of UMA. The resource owner, so you know that language from OAuth, authorizes protected resource access to clients used by entities that are in a requesting party role. That's a different role that UMA adds to OAuth. This enables party-to-party -party authorization, we often say Alice to Bob sharing, rather than authorization of application access alone. If it's too fuzzy, I'll actually just change the resolution, but let me know. Shout if you want me to do that. Okay. Um, so that's one kind of new benefit of UMA. Secondly, and there's three total, the authorization server and resource server, again, OAuth language, interact with the client and requesting party in a way that is asynchronous with respect to resource owner interactions. Meaning Alice doesn't have to be around when Bob attempts access. This lets a resource owner configure an authorization server with authorization grant rules. Hey, policies, we know this from the web access management world. At will, rather than authorizing access token issuance synchronously just after authenticating. We're all familiar with the authorize and deny buttons. You authenticate and then you say, give me an access token. Well, Alice doesn't have to wait around. She can configure policies. Enterprises get to do it, now Alice gets to do it. And then finally, I know that's a lot of text, but UMA loosely couples or federates the authorization process. This enables multiple resource servers operating in different domains, if you wish, to communicate with a single authorization server operating in yet another domain, if you wish, that acts on behalf of the resource owner. Now imagine a dashboard, a control console. I was talking with somebody who said, well, we prefer to use the phrase privacy control center because that works for our regulators when we're talking with them. And it also means a service ecosystem can thus automate resource protection. You can put resources from resource server A, resource server B, resource server C under the protection of your single authorization server. And the resource owner can monitor and control policies in a central re service location over time. Colin mentioned GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. There are starting to be regulations in the world that talk about things like the individual must be able to withdraw consent over time without detriment. Well, how do you do that? This can help. Further, with the use of token introspection, and you're probably familiar, if you're familiar with the OAuth world, the notion of token introspection, authorization grants can increase and decrease at a relatively fine grain. So this is powerful stuff we're talking about that UMA adds to the OAuth world. So what are some typical use cases? So think of these verbs, share, delegate, grant access, consent. I was just using the consent word and I've got a little picture here. Wow, that's so fuzzy. I really do want to change my resolution, but I'm not going to. If you, Anybody use Google Docs? I'm actually showing you Google Slides right now and there's a share button, not a social share button, but what do you do with the Google Docs share button? Alice shares with Bob and maybe not shares everything, shares view access, but not edit access. UMA is there to enable sharing of that constrained sort, not because it's a privacy setting, but because you're in control. That's what it's for. So the use cases are things like a patient chooses to share or shares on request in an access approval flow, something like electronic health data or even smart device data or even a smart device function. That's what APIs make, give you access to with a doctor or a caregiver or a family member. And this is where the Heart Group and OpenID Foundation has been profiling specs to do just that. And actually I'm giving a talk on Thursday right before our talk on introducing UMA 2.0 for that use case. Um, another second use case, citizen shares access to online government forms or data or other digital resources. Um, bank customer grants account access for payment purposes or for account information aggregation purposes. 
those are some use cases. There are actually, you can imagine, many more, and, and those are all uh, connected car use cases, another one. You share access to the cars functioning. Well, you want to get access to the trunk, but not drive the car. Um, the 2.0 status, actually. So UMA 1.0 was actually um, approved before this timeline starts in March of 2015, and 1.0.1, .1, which we thought of as a patch release, cleaning up a bunch of things in a backwards compatible way, was approved in December of 2015. Um, Ian was freaking out about working on something for since 2013. The UMA group actually started August 6th of 2009. That was the first group that Kantara ever started. Um, and maybe we just did it lackadaisically for a little while. I, I rushed to do it because, oh my gosh, OAuth was a thing, and that was OAuth 1.0. <laughs> so we went through a lot of learnings. Anyway, um, we, we uh, developed a, a 2016 roadmap, and we executed to it. And we did about a year's worth of editing. And we've just entered our 45-day public comment period uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, three weeks, three, actually, I think, yeah, three weeks ago, whatever. Um, and that will end July 12th, so I guess we start at end of May. Um, and what happens after that, the happy path, um, is that we will fix up the, the specs with um, any comments that we got that we're able to accept. So far it's all been editorial. And we enter the Kantara all-member balloting. As you saw, there's what, approaching 70 members and we ask them you know, what do you think? Should we approve this? And we have a really good get out the vote process and we, we have seen success so far in, in that process. What are the 2.0 themes? What were we trying to do from 1.0 to 2.0? Um, well, number one, align more closely with OAuth. Previously, we called ourselves a profile of OAuth, but it's actually a little bit more accurate to say we were an application of OAuth. We leveraged OAuth, but in fact, what we wanted to do was <clears throat> go more deeply into alignment so that it was much less of a delta um, for adoptability, um, efficiency of use, and all, you know, wide adoption. Secondly, approve suitabil improve suitability for IoT scenarios. It was already applicable to IoT scenarios. You could say it didn't discriminate against Internet of Things, but it wasn't um, useful for every single scenario. So one of the things we were able to improve was disconnected scenarios. Um, and we actually achieved that by virtue of aligning more closely to OAuth. <laughs> um, third, improve suitability for what we called wide ecosystems. And what do I mean by that? So Alice knows who she wants to share with in real life, IRL, um, but her authorization server has never met Bob before. And Bob just came onto the scene and doesn't say, have any kind of representation in Alice's authorization server. You got a smart door lock or something, and Bob just shows up, and who the heck is he? We wanted to improve how to do that, and we did. And in fact, you could say we, we achieved all these goals with a lot more simplicity, greater security, in fact, and feature parity. So we're really, really pleased with how our 2.0 came out. Status of the implementations in the world, um, several industry and open source implementations have been started, so that's been giving us good feedback. Um, we've had a couple of requests for conformance testing uh, in order to be able to have those implementations list themselves as conformant somewhere. So that's a kind of a sign that interop testing, um, you know, sort of a big interop testing process is nigh. Um, and by the way, we just realized that um, this MITRE ID Connect, which is kind of a famous implementation of OpenID Connect, it got pretty far. That's Justin et al. Uh, Justin Richard et al. Had, um, had started to implement our initial designs. It was called multi-party delegation. So um, uh, Justin had mentioned recently in our, our most recent call that, hey, if somebody wants to, you know, do some pull requests or, you know, hire him to do some work on it, <laughs> um, that, that's available as a resource. Also, um, Kantara is um, very amenable to having anybody, any interested parties do directed funding towards things like interop testing, test harnesses, and that sort of thing. So please, you know, let's talk after. Um, quick section here on our legal subgroup. UMA has a legal subgroup. 
There's a thing that we call the BLT sandwich, Daza Greenwood, um, uh, a friendly in our, our universe uh, has this phrase. BLT sandwich is business legal technical along with bacon, lettuce, and tomato and bourbon, lemon, and tonic. Really good drink. I had to try it once I heard about it. Awesome. Um, and so, you know, when you've got all these loosely coupled parties interacting on behalf of an Alice, how do you make it work? So, I collect lawyers. That's what I do. Um, it works great. And um, all these philosophical people getting together. And so, we're actually well along developing a legal framework um, to support the development of legal toolkits. Why are we doing this? Well, UMA applies these protection policies to these tokens and other artifacts. Uh, this legal framework actually maps all those artifacts on a wire, on the UMA wire, to licenses as legal devices. And that licensing mechanism is valuable, not just to the people, um, not just to the organizations that are you know, putting up services to serve the people and also be in business to make money or do whatever it is they do, but also to the legal professionals who work for those organizations for hire or whatever, and the privacy professionals that need to make sure everything is on the up and up, because it allows Alice to license Bob to use her digital resources on her terms. And you'll hear from Consent Receipt a bit later, but Consent Receipt, uh, yeah, actually Andrew is next, um, talking about uh, some of the work there, but it's very copacetic with that work. So the first toolkit will be a set of um, kind of sample contract clauses that adhere to that, that licensing um, legal framework. So we're really excited about that. Last update, the update that I had for you, have for you is about the BSCDG, Blockchain and Smart Contracts Discussion Group. And a discussion group is there to kind of formulate, ideally in a limited time frame, uh, what it might be that Kantara should do about an issue. And blockchain, there I said it again. So how many sips have you taken? Um, I feel like I need a hip flask. Um, you know, can't be too careful. Um, and I didn't have a tiny URL for this, but this is how you can um, quickly get to the home page. Um, this is a bit of an eye chart, but we had this timeline. We started on July 5th of last year. Our area of inquiry, um, as stated in our charter, was you know, vague, and what we got it down to was analyzing novel attempts to use blockchain and distributed ledger technologies to achieve an equitable distribution of accountability and risk. So not just all and everything about blockchain and DLTs, but rather what it would mean to Kantara and those who do identity stuff that is innovative um, and important to people. Um, and so we were supposed to wrap up by January 5th. We agreed to keep working, and so on January 125th, is when we delivered our report that was just missing some copy editing. Hey, you know, we all know about deadlines. Um, and so th my co-chair and I, my co-chair is Thomas Harjono of MIT, who's a wonderful, smart individual, and I can't do anything without him, it seems. Um, we actually uh, delivered the report, finalized and copy edited on June 5th, which was very recently. Um, what did this report include? Well, we analyzed a whole bunch of what we called technologies and techniques. Why technologies and techniques? Because, you know, you get into this area and it kind of involves not just technical trust, but business trust as well. So there's that BLT sandwich or cocktail or whatever. And so we analyzed all these things. So it included things like legal contracts along with smart contracts. And we delved into a lot of areas about what does trust mean? What does trustless mean? And we became very skeptical of this word trustless. And if you're of a similar mind, or if you're not of a similar mind, I really recommend that you read this report and you know, go visit our homepage and you can find the report link. Um, and we really took a, a skeptical take on the entire notion of, well, just the use of blockchain technology empowers people automatically because we did not come to that conclusion at all. Um, we also looked at the, these use cases here. So a number of kind of constructed use cases. And also we looked at the Sovereign Foundation's um, building of, well, a whole kind of ecosystem technology and kind of business um, layer for um, what's called self-sovereign identity. And I think they've moved on to some other language as well. 
Um, a lot of it had to do with health, actually, because health has a lot of use cases. We wanted to do so much more, but we kept the report to 45 pages just because we could have, you know, we could have delivered the report on Jan uh, January, you know, 1,025th, and it, we could have gone on and on. And while we were writing the, the blockchain, there I start again, you know, hype curve was changing out from under us, right? Uh, Andrew was part of it. The chain was yes, <laughs> the chain was getting longer, exactly. It never gets shorter, unless you're one of those mutable blockchains, which we looked at with a gimlet eye. Um, so here were our ultimate recommendations. We did actually recommend launching a BSC, or whatever name it would have, work group at Kantara for the purpose of um, making recommendations for good practice on use and handling of data related to individuals um, with these technologies involved. And that discussion goes on. We, can't, we didn't recommend a charter per se yet, but we recommend the elements of a charter. That's how you make a new group in Kantara. We also recommended a Kantara-wide legal work group, because so many of the groups, you know, it's not just technology, it is that sandwich or cocktail. Um, and we talked about some, you know, continuing research because it does seem to be such a nascent area. And I did just want to um, give a shout out to all the, all the discussion group participants and also um, Torsten um, from uh, the IRM group who specifically, <laughs> And also ID Pro, I guess some of the language that we grabbed from the description of identity and access management itself was contributed from these other groups. So this is a classic example of the works um, uh, working together. So I just want to thank you. And while there's a transition, I just want to see if anybody here is a, an humanitarian, uh, that's what we call ourselves. Um, if you're interested, I happen to bring a few of the uh, UMA stickers with me considering um, making UMA 2 stickers, so now's your chance to get some of the remaining old ones. <laughs> Thank you.